Hi guys and welcome back to the giant world of tiny things and another macro video. Today's topic is refraction photography and in this video we'll have a brief look at the science behind it before I show you my sample setup and explain everything you need to know in order to take stunning refraction shots yourself. So what does refraction mean exactly? I'm glad you asked. Refraction is actually quite a broad scientific term that describes the process of waves passing from one medium into another. Generally speaking this could be any kind of wave but obviously in a photographic context we are referring to light waves. And more specifically when you hear photographers talk about refraction or refraction photography most of the time they refer to the lens like effects of round transparent subjects such as lens balls or water droplets. Because of their round shape such subjects act just like a camera lens and focus parallelly entering light rays into a so called focal point where these light rays converge and form a sharp projection of whatever the scene in behind might be. This projection is called an aerial image and this image will be located in between you the observer and that round subject you're looking at. It is always slightly in front of that subject and this can make it difficult to get every part of the composition that matters to you in focus. Let's have a look at my sample setup to talk about this in more depth. This is the completed setup as I'm going to photograph it. Let's have a closer look at it beginning with the backdrop. As you can see I placed my backdrop photograph quite close to the rest of the scene which makes sure of two things. First of all this way I avoid the edges of that print from being a part of the projection we're photographing and so I don't give away the fact that it's a print rather than a real flower which just looks more appealing and more natural. The other beneficial side effect is the fact that it makes for the best lighting or rather the best yield of light that I could possibly achieve because according to the inverse squirrel light falls off exponentially. In other more simple words if I just move the backdrop photo out to double the distance I would only get a quarter of the light, meaning that having it as close as possible will make the image and its projection as dominant in your composition as it could possibly get. So move it in as close as you can get it without distorting it too much in your projection, because our spherical subject is going to act like a fish eye lens and if you get too close there will be a lot of distortion. And when it comes to picking a suitable backdrop your own imagination really is the only limit there is. You can use a physical backdrop backdrop such as a real flower or a little scene that you stage in behind with whatever materials you have at hand or can think of. You can use a magazine print that really inspires you or a print of your own images. And if you don't have anything suitable in your archive feel free to visit the link in the description below which will take you to my website and a free gallery of backdrop images for refraction photography that you're more than welcome to use. Last but not least of course you could stage this whole scene outside and use an actual landscape for your backdrop just be aware that whatever background you choose optics are going to flip it vertically so make sure to take that into equation when you stage your scene and pre-visualize your shot. Let's talk about lighting next. As you can see I'm using a little torch on a stand to illuminate the backdrop image and put an emphasis on that projection but of course this is not my main light source for the actual exposure. The actual main light source is a on camera speed light with a diffuser which just makes for a nicer softer look and it also avoids harsh specular highlights and reflections on the sphere we're photographing. If you don't have a diffuser at hand you can simply bounce your flash off the ceiling and if you don't even have a flash use a tripod and a longer exposure time as long as your subject is a static one. Now let's get down to business and take some actual images. Currently my camera is set to 1 200, ISO 100 and f16. My flash is set to 1 4th of its power. Now f16 is quite a narrow aperture but with macro photography the depth of field is very thin to begin with and I'll be photographing this at almost 2x which narrows the depth of field down even further. Let's see what we can get. Thank you. 
Not too bad, but still we did not quite get everything in focus. Now this photo demonstrates really well how hard it is to get the whole scene in focus in the true macro range, but there's something else that it demonstrates really well. Have a close look at the portion of the rock that is in focus. It's located in front of the Orbi, which just goes to demonstrate that the projection is located in front of our subject and this is why it's so hard to get the whole scene in focus. But fortunately there are some workarounds. The easiest way of course is to work at a lower magnification ratio and attach a less magnifying lens and then crop it in post. Unfortunately this is going to reduce your resolution and therefore the image quality at a comparable size to a not crop photo. Another alternative is to use a crop sensor or a teleconverter. Both these methods get you closer without compromising the depth of field. If you don't have either of that equipment at hand, well the last and most advanced option is focus stacking. This will yield you the best image quality out of all the mentioned options and it's not as hard as many people believe it is. If you never did it before, check out the videos in the description below. I got a couple tutorials on that matter as well. Now we're pretty close already to the end of this video, but before we get there and wrap it up, there's a couple more things that I wanted to talk to you about. First of all, I do understand that Orbeez are not the most common or popular refraction subject, but I choose them for a reason. First of all, a water droplet simply would have evaporated by now with my studio lights on, but the other reason is that this just demonstrates the vast variety of subjects that you can actually choose from. In just another bit, I'll finish this video up with a slideshow of different subjects subjects that I photographed over the last year and the variety of them is going to surprise you. Last but not least I wanted to spend a minute talking about actual water droplet refraction because I know that is the most popular subject and it can be challenging to get these droplets just right. First of all you want to maintain a spherical shape for them so that you get the nicest optical effect. There is a couple tricks that help with that. First of all, mix a little bit of glycerin in with your water, that increases its surface tension and just keeps them more spherical. And the other trick is to experiment with different substrates and find one that works really well for you. Generally plants make for a nice and aesthetical subject, but it really depends on the plant if it's going to work well or not. I personally found the feel of plants and their foliage to be a very good indicator. Generally waxy and rubbery feeling plants are going to work very well. Amongst them aloe vera and some kinds of ivy. Grass blades also are a great starting point, but the best and most reliable way to tell is to simply go for a walk on a rainy day and observe the plants in your neighborhood. The best way to apply your droplets is to carefully place them with a syringe. Now that's it for today's video. I really hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and leave me a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to watch the slideshow in the end of this video for some creative input. I'll see you next time. Until then, stay creative and have a good time. Cheers!